Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Lu Ngo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. We're here every week to talk about happiness. And to be honest, I still don't know what it is, but I'm very excited to figure it out week by week to understand different topics about happiness. And today we have in our virtual studio, a very special guest who has a lot of experience in the topic that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to introduce her in a little bit. And for context, we're going to talk about stress and optimum functioning today. So our guest today is Rita K. Gonto. She shows busy people how to go from feeling crappy to happy with simple self-care. She is the author of Simple Self-Care Saved Me. She's going to show us the book in a little bit. And she has an amazing backstory to tell us about you know, why she wrote the book, how she got here and why she's doing the work that she's doing. It's been really fun talking to her before we started the recording. And honestly, I could chat to her forever. But in the interest of time, we're going to start our conversation today and we're going to go into the show very soon. But first thing first, Rita, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. And would you mind sharing a bit more of your backstory with us? Oh my gosh, thank you, Lou. This is really fun. And like I said earlier, I'm speaking in the future to the future because I'm I'm in the uh, United States and you're in Australia, which is I think so cool. So I'm talking to tomorrow. Wow. So how did I get here? Um, probably the the biggest thing was back in 2009. My husband and I, uh, after four miscarriages and three years in the adoption system, we became parents of two beautiful toddlers. Two toddlers at the same time, their sisters. One was 18 months and one was almost four. And so at this time, uh, I was almost 46. So that summer, I found myself sobbing uncontrollably on our deck. I had everything I wanted, right? I was a mom. I had a thriving massage therapy business, good marriage, food over, you know, food on our tables, uh, roof over our heads. And I'm finally a mom. And here I am sobbing uncontrollably and feeling like I'm the worst mom ever, ever. And I was even having suicidal thoughts. There were some mornings I was waking up and asking myself, well, wouldn't it be easier if I just wasn't here? And so when you think about that, it's like, wait, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't sort of com- compute, right? Like you've got everything, but so I realized I was stress overloaded completely. And it was, I took a trip to my doctor and he gave me a prescription. And then he said to me, this was the most important question. This changed my life is what changes are you going to make? And I looked at him and I'm like, what changes am I going to make? And he just gave me the, a prescription, right? The happy pill It's going to make everything better. And so after I thought about it for a while, it's like, wait, so if I can make changes and decrease the stress in my life, then I have a little bit I do have control over this uncontrollable world and life. And so that was really the beginning of my journey. Um, My daughters are now almost 16 and 18. And that led me, you know, on my path of what I call simple self-care. I'll explain that a little bit more later and writing the book. And that's, that's what I teach now. I'm now retired from massage therapy and I do workshops for businesses and companies and small groups. And I do my own self-care workshops. So you know, yeah, figure out what, what it takes to survive. And so I thought, well, maybe at this point in my life, you know, it's my purpose to serve and I can show other people how I made, made it through. So, yeah. Wow. What, what a, an amazing story. And, you know, when you told me about what happened, I, I heard it. I'm like, is that just stress or is it burnout? Because it's, it sounds like it's edging towards a lot of burnout. Um, and, you know, it's not just the regular stress that people talk about because you went through so much. Correct. And so, you know, I I talk about and I am a self-proclaimed science nerd. So I love to connect the dots between science and and what's happening. And 
so like this, we are, we're all having, we all have a stress response. It's built in. We, it's, it's part of our neurobiology. We're fighting that neurobiology. It's been with us since the beginning of time, right? And it is a safety mechanism for us that when we meet, we get, we're into a situation where it's an immediate crisis or a life-threatening situation. You know, our brain triggers the stress response and adrenaline and cortisol are released and then all these things happen in our body. Well, that was great for our ancestors, but thanks to our great human race that's evolving, that stress response has not evolved. So unfortunately, then we have a stress response that if our kids are throwing a tantrum and we don't know how to calm them or, oh my gosh, now how am I going to fit work and being a mom and being a wife and seeing my friends and, oh my gosh, I spilled that cup of coffee all over me and I'm late for a presentation and a flat tire and on and on and on, right? We've created all these are these multitude of psychological stressors that are not uh, immediate crisis, but yet our brain thinks it is based on our limbic system and our memories and all these emotions and things like that. So it's, it's huge. And then you get the stress response over and over and over again, which then is called stress overload. And then you get to the point of burnout where you're exhausted. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite the thing. And I, uh, I never really dealt well with stress. Like I got overwhelmed easily all my life. And as a teenager, I would journal and I would exercise. I played sports, I'd go running. So, you know, those things are really important. And as adults, usually then we stop doing stuff like that. So, Mm. but there's lots to unpack here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's so much to unpack. And you just got me thinking there because um, I think from, you know, even from our early years in our teenage years or in our 20s um, up until, you know, like later in life, there are different coping mechanisms and strategies that we're going to use and we're going to keep learning from them, too. So we'll talk about that. And uh, because, you know, it's pretty clear we have a big age gap between us. So I can learn a lot from you and I can share my own experience and you can tell me if it's on the right direction or not. And yeah, there, there'll be so much uh, fun that we're going to have uh, in this conversation. But before we do that, let's get to know you a bit better. We have a section we called Have You Met Rita? And this is my favorite section because I get recommendations from my guests. I get to know them a little bit better on a personal level. And our audience is, you know, always enjoying getting to know all these different recommendations too. So the first question we always ask is what is a book you would recommend? I actually have two books. Um, one book is The Gift of Imperfection by Brene um, Brown. That Brene. That, cha- that really changed my life. The second one is uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. Yeah, well, I, I, I love that book. Yeah, I love Brene. I haven't heard about the second book, though, so I'm going to have to put the second book on my reading list. Thank you for that. Sounds really interesting. How about a movie? Uh, you know, when I think about my one of my favorite movies, I love Disney, and I I think, you're going to laugh at me, Rapunzel is probably my favorite Disney movie, and I think it's because my girls were at that age where they wanted to watch it over and over and over again. And I loved, I loved the humor and I loved the fact the horse acted like a dog and the chameleon, P- Pascal, who I named one of my cats after. And so I, I love whimsy and I love, yeah, just simple and happy. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. yeah totally. Yeah, Rapunzel is one of my favorite Disney movies too. I remember, yeah. I think I've watched it like five times. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah hilarious. I love it. Um, what about a podcast? Um, Jay Shetty, I think, would be, um, he's just really inspiring. And I, you know, I love to hear, you know, he used to be a monk and he's so down to earth and he's so real and he's, he's young and he's, uh, you know, and it's, I've, I've watched his career evolve and it really, it really is amazing what he's doing. So love Jay Shetty. Yeah, the On Purpose podcast is a really good series. And I love how how many different people he interviewed. And, you know, I recently saw the one uh, where he interviewed Lewis Hamilton, one of the Formula One champion. Um, and yeah, like it was such a good conversation. And yeah, I love Jay's energy. Anyone on my team would know I love Jay Shetty. Uh, so yeah, really love that. Fantastic. Okay. 
Who is your famous role model? Or if not a famous person, who is your personal role model? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think if, on some level, you know, my, my parents really have inspired me because um, they grew up uh, in Germany at the end of World War II. So they are both were refugees. And my dad came over, to, uh, moved over to Canada, uh, west coast of Canada, um, in the early 50s. And then my mom followed him. And I just, like, they built a life out of nothing. So I think the work ethic and um, I just, they really inspired me. Just, they're both, they're both gone. Um, but they really inspired me. And I, and I so appreciate over the principles and all the things that they taught me. So I think I have to say my parents. Yeah, that's beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And final question in this section, what is a course you've completed that you would like to talk about? A course I have completed lately. I've started lots. Uh, <laughs> I, haven't. Um, I really don't have a course that I've completed lately. I think... Um, just being a mom and and being an entrepreneur and speaker and author and all that, it sort of hasn't left a lot of room for me improving, doing some personal growth and and uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be something you've completed. Like it could be something that you started and you found really interesting. Aromatherapy. I'm I'm looking forward to getting an aromatherapy certification. I have a 200 hour program that I've started. And uh, yeah, I know we're near completing, but I find essential oils absolutely fascinating. And again, it's, be it's between, it connects the science and the woo-woo, so. Ah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. It's so wonderful. Like, I, I love it when people like connecting the science and the woo-woo. <laughs> well, and that what I didn't mention is for t my first 20 years, my career, I was a respiratory therapist. And so I worked in the hospital in Canada, in Saudi Arabia for four and a half years, was there during the Gulf War. I know stress. And then I moved, uh, I moved here to North Carolina and I actually uh, flew on the trauma flight team at Carolina's Medical Center here in Charlotte for several years. So I actually, I did my first stress management lecture in 1997. So little did I know that that's sort of where I was, you know, headed. Um, but it was, um, yeah, I know stress, like, and I don't deal well with stress. So yeah. this has been a, you know, a real learning process for me and survival. Yeah. So. Wow. Amazing. Well, you're going to have a lot to share in our next section very soon because I'm just thinking about all that. I'm trying to not get into the state where, you know, like I'm absorbing all the stress from hearing what you just said. <laughs> um, but it's good to keep it in mind, right? Because like it's so easy. And to preface the conversation, before we go into the conversation, I have to say, it's so easy to be stressed out on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can I cannot emphasize how many times I feel the tension in my body unknowingly. Like, you know, I would deal with something or a certain situation. I'll be like, wait, why are my muscles so tight? You know, like, why am I clenching my fist? You know, like things like that. Anyways, we'll get into that. But before we do, let's talk about happiness. This show is all about happiness, Rita. And all of our guests have very different definitions. I wonder to you, what does happiness mean? I think happiness is more being content in the moment. Um, happiness is a journey to me. It's not an end point. And I think often we are so caught up with, well, I'll be happy when I lose 10 pounds. I'll be happy when I get that new car. I'll be happy when we, we get finally, you know, adopt two kids. I'll be happy when I have X amount of dollars in the bank. And I think then we lose sight of 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 the of the moment we're in, and um, so to me that's happiness. Happiness is walking out right now. I've uh, a whole assortment of lilies that are blooming in in my backyard, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And and they're simple. And just to look at them, there's 30 blooms with several plants within like five feet. And for me, happiness is just looking at those lilies and just being in awe of what you know, God has created and what is there. And I take a few deep breaths and I'm just so grateful to be able to share that. Yeah. So, so for me, it's very much keeping, keeping things simple. Like how can I, okay, you know, my tax bills do or something, but how in this moment can I be grateful that 
you know, my one of my daughters has come up to me and told me a really funny story and happy that, wow, she's my daughter. Right. So those moments where you can grab happiness rather than being in a state all the time. Yeah, totally. I really love that because I think we are we're all constantly, you know, chasing something. And uh, I think everyone is probably used to the term chasing happiness to a certain extent. You know, some some of us do that. Some of us talk about that. Some of us unknowingly embrace it. And I think it's such a big deal because what I realized recently as well is how much simpler life could be if we just embrace the now and embrace what we have right now. You know, like even if it's because um, a lot of people talk about work like it's it's dreadful, but you know I, I think it's easy to just say I enjoy this. This is the stress that I choose, and you know we're talking about stress very soon. And I think one of the aspects of stress that I like is that you get to choose the stress in your life. You know the work that you're doing, whatever it is, it is what you chose to do, and I think it's time to appreciate it. You know it's definitely never fun. Uh, when you have a really tense period at work or, you know, it's really hectic and busy. But we can learn so much and grow so much from it. And I think that's where we need to embrace the stress. And then at the same time, when we're just constantly looking forward to the weekend, we're not really enjoying the week. We're not enjoying our day. And so we're wasting away our lives. And that's how I feel, you know, to a certain extent, a couple of months ago, that's how I felt when I was really burnt out. And I was like, wait, Lou, hang on a second. But today is great. No matter the weather today is great, you know, like you have so much to look forward to, like even just what I'm going to have for lunch, you know, like, oh, like, do I go for a walk today? What's going to happen at the gym? You know, like <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So I, I think it's a it's a really great definition that you just share with us. And I think it's a great practice to ground ourselves in the now. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about more of that very soon, I think, because some of the questions are kind of related to this. But um one, one other thing that we always ask on the show is we notice a lot of misconceptions from people around us, right? We have our own definition. Um, we notice misconceptions from everywhere. So to you, what are some of the biggest things that people tend to get wrong when it comes to happiness? You know, I, you know, social media comes to mind. Um, and with all the filters, you know, on Snapchat and you've got filters on Instagram, filters are everywhere. And so... You know, I, I, it's just so hard for me when someone can't ex cannot be happy with what they've been given and then change it with a filter. So I'm now searching happiness through a filter so I look like somebody else. But in, then in the real world, in reality, I don't look like that. So I'm kind of lying to myself. And then trying to keep up with everybody else. Well... You know, she has this shaped nose or she has this shaped boobs or she's got these lips or, you know, and, and searching, searching for things that are going to make you happy when in fact you're just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard. I don't know if I'm, I've, if I'm making sense, but you are. It, it's just, we get so caught up in chasing something. We're chasing this happiness rather than sitting back and going, okay. I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table. It's, it's simple, right? I've got a yeah. job. I have people that love me. Maybe I need to start loving myself a little bit more. Maybe I need to, you know, change my mindset to something a little bit more positive. You know, the glass half full instead of that glass half empty. So there's, I mean, we, we could probably unpack that for hours, Lou, because there's, yeah. there's so much. And social media doesn't help. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you. And uh, well, I'm happy to report that I'm off social media. <laughs> I've been off social media for, I think, about a month and a half now. It's great. And, you yeah, know, I was going to ask you, so so how how have you found, how has that changed your anxiety level or your stress level? Uh, well, I would, I wouldn't know about the anxiety and stress level because I, I was actually from a place of feeling really burnt out and feeling really overwhelmed with life and not enjoying anything. So it's for me, it's not the, the anxiety and stress, but it's actually my happiness increased and I lived in the moment so much more. Um, the reason for that is because, you know, I realized how much time I wasted on social media. Look, it's not a bad place. 
But when you get this influx of information from, you know, all over the place, it just doesn't help when you're already dealing with a lot in life. And I think for me, like, it's just really good to filter what I look at. So, you know, I, I follow a lot of different accounts, like people that I admire or, you know, like um, accounts that are educational, but obviously the algorithm on these platforms, they show you what you don't really want to see sometimes. And so I made the conscious decision to stop using them. I still use Facebook to stay in touch with friends and family, but like I post probably like once, <laughs> once a quarter. Um, and, you know, like I, I check it once a week at most because I just mainly use it to message my friends and family at home, um, considering I'm living abroad. So I think it's just fun for me to notice how much better I use my time. So I cannot really tell you the level of anxiety and stress, but I can tell you I feel much happier I feel like I'm utilizing my time really well. I'm reading more. And when I feel the need to use my phone, I open Kindle instead of Instagram. That's, that's what I love. And I think it's a really positive change. And my friends are like, oh, I cannot send you this funny meme. And I'm like, well, just text me. Send me the link. <laughs> I'll open it. <laughs> I can see it. You know, like just text me the link go open it it's fine and uh i'm not missing out on anything you know in fact i enjoy the conversations i have with my friends so much more because i don't see their updates on social media so i'll be like what's up with you tell me about what's going on and then they'll show me photos on their phone they'll be like they'll tell me the actual story rather than just the highlights i really love that yeah well and i i think probably we have an ep epidemic of uh or a pandemic of FOMO, fear of missing out. For yeah. some reason, I think this generation is like, well, if I'm not on here, I'm missing something. You know, it's mm. like, no. Yeah. You know, you have to create your own, yeah, create your own stuff. Yeah. yeah. It causes a lot of stress, actually, when you see what people are up to and then you're kind of like, oh, why didn't I know about that? Or, you know, like, why didn't I go here and there? Oh, I need to do this and that. Not really. You know, like, I think it's actually really good to I like living like the old days. And this sounds really funny, but I, I like, you know, the, the age where all I could do to stay in touch with friends were to call them. No texting, you know, like I actually really miss that when I was so much younger. I just miss going, you know, going home from school and doing my homework and doing my things. And then, you know, like if a friend misses me or if I want to talk to a friend about something, I'll call them and actually have a conversation rather than bits and bobs of messages here and there. And I think that's what we don't do enough anymore because, you know, calling friends is such a foreign concept now. You text and you text on different platforms even. So, you know, like maybe I'm living in nostalgia. I don't know, but I just really enjoy that aspect. And I feel like it, it simplifies life and I enjoy life so much more. No, I, Lou, I absolutely agree. And I think you see so much anxiety. I see it in my kids. Um, you know, they're checking this message and checking that and doing this and doing this instead of just sort of being right here and in the now and, and you know, walking to your your friend's house um, and having a face to face conversation. So, yeah, I, I hear that. I think research is showing that, too, that um, you spend too much time on social media or you get into mental health issues. So, yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about stress now, because this is kind of related, right? We were kind of mentioning stress, anxiety, you know, using social media, chasing happiness, not living in the now. So a lot of these things are interconnected to a certain degree. But um, what I told you earlier before we started the recording was I'm curious because stress is not a foreign concept. In fact, a lot of people are like, how are you? Oh, I'm stressed, <laughs> right? Really easy. People can easily use that word without having to, th to think again. But what is stress really? How do you define it? And what are some of the things that we might not know when it comes to stress? Well, I think what's really important and part of um, what I'll do in some of my workshops is when I talk about the stress response, I talk about the different things that go, that happen. I call it the cascade of effects that happen in our body. So a lot, most of us are familiar with increased heart rate, right? In increased blood pressure. And we start breathing faster and our muscles get tight. So the heart rate, the blood pressure, and the breathing go up just to in order to draw in more oxygen and then the blood flow circulates more quickly so then you can feed those muscles so you can either literally run or fight. 
So what we what we most people don't realize is while all that's going on, then our liver is dumping a whole bunch of sugar into our blood to also feed the muscles. And then our digestive tract is shut off. The blood flow is is diverted because it's not important right now. It doesn't matter what you ate for lunch, you know, an hour ago. Right now we're in a life and death situation or so your brain thinks we don't need you to work. We don't need our immune system to work right now. Even the blood flow in our brain changes. So our our blood flow is diverted from our prefrontal cortex, which is the smart part of our brain, the logical thinking doesn't mature until 25 in our kids. Um, so that blood flow is diverted from here to a more primitive part of our brain because it's a survival instinct. Our stress response is survival instinct. So literally we stop thinking. So Lou, how many times have you, you know, got into an argument with somebody or felt maybe a little threatened or, um, in a difficult situation and said something and then later on you thought oh my gosh I can't believe I said that right what was I thinking mm-hmm. well honestly you weren't thinking mm-hmm. so there's a lot of these components that happen every time we have a stress a stress response so if we get stressed 20 30 40 times during the day whether it's traffic whether it's kids whether it's work whether it's all of those you know, then you start thinking about, well, gee, I wonder why, um, you know, I'm gassy or I'm bloated or why I have diarrhea, why I have constipation, why does my stomach hurt all the time? Yeah. Why do I have, you know, why do I, does my upper back hurt? Why does my lower back hurt? How come I have headaches or migraines? That's all muscle tension. And then pre-diabetes, you know, you think about it, you've got this this bunch of sugar dumping into your blood. Well, your, your pancreas can only secrete so much insulin. At some point, it's going to get tired diabetes, heart disease. So there's these lasting effects of stress overload. Mm. So I think a lot of people don't know that part. Oh, it's like, oh, I feel anxious. I'm tired. I'm, I feel, you know, I'm so stressed, but they don't really understand what's happening here. Rashes on your skin, getting uh, sick a lot. Um, all of a sudden, you know, you're drinking three pots of coffee instead of just one, maybe <laughs> at night, you know, that, that glass of wine that used to be one glass of wine now is two, three, four, half a bottle, maybe a whole bottle. Mm. And, you know, that and, and I say that without judgment. You know, what I yep. what I teach is that if, if you're in that situation or can relate, it needs to be an awareness that, oh, I'm getting into trouble with stress and I really need to up my self-care. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Did oh, that answer wow. your question? That was a lot oh, of words. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> totally. No, totally. I think you mentioned something super important because, um, and this is a little story. I told you I'm going to tell you stories. So this is a little story of uh, of my friend. And, and I say her, she's a friend. She's much younger than me. She's 19. And she's, you know, in her first year of uni being away from home for the first time in her life living across the continent. And now she's stressed. But it's not the regular uni kid stress. She's so stressed out that... Uh, Something happened to her body and she doesn't understand why, you know, um, and might be TMI, but she got her period twice in a month and she didn't know why. And I was like, well, obviously you're so stressed out. So you need, you need to up that stress management game and that self-care game. And we need to talk about it, right? Uh, I don't have a lot of expertise as much as you do, but I kind of read that it was because of stress. And then fast forward a couple of weeks later, we, we go to the gym every morning together and then she, she goes, oh, I had a mental breakdown yesterday. And I was like, say what? Well, she was so stressed out previously. She didn't really manage that properly. And then it all just, it started to bubble up and then it it burst one day because she was, you know, like absorbing all this information from her friends, um, you know, while dealing with her own situation of being overwhelmed at uni and being far away from home. She had a mental breakdown. And she cried and her parents were definitely very, very worried, but you know, she's a strong girl. She could, she could handle herself. However, that was a really clear example of, you know, stress that wasn't managed properly because she didn't know. And obviously a lot of us don't know about this, even, you know, adults in their twenties, thirties, they might not even know. And that's what you said that was so important, right? The signs could show in our bodies. And I told you, I didn't realize this either. I was like, oh, I, I was actually, I think last year I was sick about five times. I didn't know why back then. I know now. 
I know better now. I do better now. So, you know, lots of self-care, sort of a lot of lots of setting boundaries and making sure that I have time to rest and, you know, do activities that recharge me. But I learned through my mistakes. So for our audience, you know, it would be great for them to know to manage this better. So they don't necessarily have to learn from their their own mistakes, but, could, you know, could learn from your mistakes, my mistakes, and the mistakes of the people that we've learned from. Uh, so my next question to you would be stress management and happiness. You know, how do we manage our stress in a way that would foster our happiness, given all the information that we know? And, you know, I know that you are really strong on self-care, and I really love that because that's something we don't do enough, especially women. So let's talk about that. Okay, I think, um, you know, you touched on a lot of, good points, Lou, and one of them is, you know, boundaries, especially uh, for women. So when I talk about self-care, what I'm specifically talking about is simple self-care. Um, so, you know, going to the gym, uh, uh, going for walks, you know, ma massage, facials, mani-pedis, all those things, I sort of think of them as more traditional self-care is usually what we think of when someone's talking about self-care. And they are all fabulous. The, the problem with them is, you know, you usually have to change your shoes or your clothes. You have to block out a time. Like you go to the gym for an hour. There's, you know, getting there is cleaning up afterwards, showering if you're, you know, um, going to work right after that. So when we get really tired and we are stressed and life gets a little bit hectic and we feel overwhelmed, what's the first thing that we're going to drop out of our schedule? going to the gym. If you go to the gym in the morning, I'm too tired. I'm going to sleep in. And I found out when I was a new mom and running a massage therapy business and, you know, being involved with all the other things that, you know what, for a while there, I got about five o'clock in the morning to get to the gym so I could be home. So my husband could go to work. Uh, and then after that, it's like, I can't do this. So then I started looking at different sorts of self-care. And so I define simple self-care as those things you can slide in during your in the day, any time. So um, actually, let's just take a moment now. Like, So everyone okay. who's listening, and you too, Lou and Aiden, uh, just get comfortable in your chair, feet flat on the floor. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And then just take a big breath in. And then all the way out. Another big breath in. And this time when you exhale, imagine the tension in your neck and your shoulders just running down your arms and just into the floor. Just let your shoulders relax with every time you exhale. Big breath in and all the way out. Another big breath in and out. Now on your next breath in, I want you to wiggle your toes. Yes, it's an odd request. Keep breathing in and out. Now wiggle your toes and check in with your toes. Are they warm? Are they cold? Are you wearing comfy shoes? Do you have fuzzy socks on? How do your toes feel this morning? Big breath in. Keep wiggling your toes. Big breath in. All the way out. And open your eyes. So it takes 30 seconds for you to let your brain know that you are not in danger. So you can switch from fight or flight to resting and digesting mode to operating systems. And so that's one of my favorite things is to deep breathe. And even if I'm driving, obviously I'll keep my eyes open. I'll wiggle my fingers on the steering wheel or I'll wiggle my toes. And there's, we have uh, I-77 here in Charlotte. I seven lanes merged down to like three and I just I so dislike driving it so I'm breathing it I'm wiggling you know and it's it's enough to let your brain know that you're safe and then your your body systems can start returning back to normal you get blood flow to your digestive tract your immune system gets some energy um you know and your heart rate blood pressure all that starts to normalize so that's an example of simple self-care you don't have to plan it but you need to be aware of, oh, yeah, I'm feeling a little tense right now. Um, let me pick up one of my simple self-care tools and I'm going to do one of those right now. So that's sort of where it all started. Yeah, I love that. I think um, that that is something we forget to do. 
I remember, I don't remember where I picked this up from. I think one of the books or um, something that I was reading. And uh, it basically said we forget to breathe. And I was like, what? No, I don't. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, I'm holding my breath. I'm not breathing. And like I, I, tell, I talk about this all the time on the show ever since I started going to the gym. My Pilates instructor is always saying breathe. Don't forget to breathe. And I was like that initially, I was like, that's so silly. But then I was like, oh, actually, when I'm really focused on a move and I need to tense my muscle, I need to like, you know, hold my core, I would forget to breathe actually. So that's not silly at all. And it applies to everyday life as well. So then, you know, after the gym session, I'll go to work and I'll be like, Lou, don't forget to breathe. This is going to be a hard task, but don't forget to breathe. And, you know, now that you have taught us this little simple exercise, I'm going to incorporate that into my routine as well, you know, 30 seconds between tasks, that's going to help us improve our concentration, our focus, and, you know, so much more. This is really practical. Uh, but let's go back to the theory a little bit, because, you know, we'll get even more practical in the next section. But we were talking about, you know, stress management, um, and you give us a really simple tool. But how about this relationship? You know, we have stress management, we have happiness, we also have uh, something we haven't mentioned yet, which is the ability to experience joy and fulfillment in life. And a lot of this is related to stress, right? Because when you're stressed out and you don't manage your stress properly, you don't live in the moment, you don't find joy. And th I am telling you this because this is my personal experience. This is what I've realized over the course of the several months that just passed, that I'm still burnt out. I haven't properly managed my burnt out, my stress. And we you know, I haven't managed my burnout and then I have more stress added on top of that. And I don't feel any joy at all in my life. I don't feel a sense of fulfillment, even though I'm doing a lot. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of like one thing leads to another and they kind of create this vicious cycle. So you're the expert. You tell us, you know, how can we manage our stress better in the sense of the relationship between stress management and happiness and joy and all that sort of, th all that sort of things. Well, I, you know, I think when we are really stressed and a lot of things are bombarding us, you know, we go into what I call survival mode is like you are just doing, you know, you're just getting things done that need to get done. And there is no room for a happiness because your, your brain's thinking and then, you know, you're, you're, yeah. You know, your thought patterns are sort of going in circles and then the cortisol changes the way you think and how you feel and you're not sleeping. Uh, you know, it's, your sleep patterns are all in a wax. If you don't get enough sleep, of course, you wake up miserable. I know I do. Uh, you know, so all these things pile on top of one another. So so again, it's having that awareness. You had that awareness, Lou, that you were burning out something, something you were burnt out. Something was not right. And it's the joy and the happiness, I think, come from those small moments of gratitude where you can just give yourself, you know, the power of the pause where you're, you know, you're in a really busy, big, busy, busy day, but take that 30 seconds to a minute and just, say, you know, sink in. And I think those are the little moments where you can find joy and happiness because um, otherwise they, you know, we become negative because we feel like crap, right? We don't feel good. We, oh, I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this. And you feel like a, a gerbil on a, you know, one of the, the wheels, um, so it's just so important to take those little pauses because you're not going to find joy or find happiness anywhere in the midst of that, that survival mode. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, definitely. That's just what we need to be reminded, you know, it's, it's honestly, I don't think it's anything new, but we just forget about it. We forget about the fact that it's it's going to affect us massively if we don't manage our stress properly. Just like I told you about my friend and I told you about myself, I for a really long time couldn't see any better, couldn't do any better because I didn't manage my stress properly and uh, it affected me massively. But I also know that you have a very unique stress management system. Uh, yourself, because I think you. This is what you wrote in the book. You know the um, the book called "Simple Self Care Saved Me." I think you have that in front of you. If you want to show our audience? There you go. Looks wonderful. Um, so I think it's it's a simple thing that we tried uh, just just now. You know the thirty seconds of of deep breathing with our eyes closed. But I'm sure there's so much more to it. So 
to, to tell our audience about this, um, can you share with us a bit more about how you came to develop this system and what else is involved? What else can we try ourselves in our everyday lives to help us manage our stress better? Okay, so I think, you know, thinking back to, you know, when the doctor said, what changes are you going to make? Um, those were simple self-care changes, but I didn't really realize. So um, I had back surgery in my mid-20s. So I always, I have a chron, I have chronic back pain. And I get really tight, tight hip flexors. So one of the first things I incorporated is stretching while I brush my teeth, right? I'm going to be brushing my teeth, hopefully, at least twice a day for two minutes. So I put my foot up on the counter and I'd stretch my, out my, hip, my tight hip flexors. And you know what? I had a little less back pain. And then I was a little happier and I wasn't so crabby. Right? <laughs> so that was beneficial. Then the girls were happier. I was happier. So that's really how it started. Um, I've been using flaxseed neck warmers, you know, the ones you throw in the microwaves, microwave for a yep. long time. So, you know, you wake up and you're like this and I have a headache. I throw one of those in while I'm making coffee or tea or making the girls breakfast and put those on my shoulders. That, again, is simple self-care. I'm sliding it into my day. It's simple. It's not complex. It's not rocket science. And it's it's um taking care of my mental or physical or spiritual or emotional health. That's what self-care is. So um, let's see, other things. Uh, the bus stop was just down the street when the girls were in elementary school. And I did not, didn't always have time for a long 30-minute, 40-minute hour long walk. So just walking to the bus stop and back, we have a very hilly neighborhood, 10, 15 minutes was enough to get outside. I pay attention to the sky, the trees, the birds, and I got some movement. So those little things during the day really started to add up. And over time, what I've done is I've created three categories of simple self-care. And the three categories are because we're all different people. We like different things. And also there's different situations. So the three categories are in the moment, movement, and then mind unfulness, which is a word I made up, which means brain dump. <laughs> so, so then you you can you know you sort of pick and i and i do actually have like uh, i've made a chart worth all three of them and they're all different options um so for example okay so in the moment deep breathing absolutely but what about engaging one of your senses what if um you know you're feeling particularly stressed maybe you had a difficult podcast with somebody um you know you could, you know i'm sure that never happens <laughs> you know, you could go outside for a moment and just take a deep breath and then like, well, how many, you know, different birds can I hear? Or um, are there any flowers blooming? I guess you're in fall, right? Are you in fall? We're in winter. We, we just winter, got into winter. winter. Yeah. Okay. So that's very different from here. Um, so, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you, like here I would look to see, you know, you could check and see if there's any leaves on the trees. You know, here I can see how many different color green I see. I see. Or if you have a, a cat or a dog, you know, petting, feeling that that soft fur and really feeling it or taking a piece of chocolate and melting it in your mouth and the flavors and the consistency. So that's very much in the moment. And then mm. movement is simple as, you know, let's all just, you know, do some shoulder rolls while we're sitting here. Yeah. Right. So yeah. just do some shoulder rolls or, my, you know. Um, if we were live, I'd get you to stand up and, you know, stretch and move. And again, Ooh, it's, I feel like yeah, I'm it's back that, in my Pilates class now. I'm happy. <laughs> so that's increasing blood flow and yeah. feeding those tight muscles. Mm. And then the mind unfulness, the brain dumping is usually Monday mornings, you know, I'll come up to my dad, my office and it's like, okay, what, what do I need to get done this week? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got, it. so I start writing it down, make a list. I can do this on this day. I'll do this on that day. This can wait to next week. Um, journaling, um, you know, reading scripture uh, or, you know, uh, positive affirmations, mantras, all those things where you can just give your brain a break for a minute from all the chaos. Yeah. Um, gratitude journals are great. So those are the three categories. And so I kind of bounce between all of them. Yeah. You know, pick, a, pick a favorite yoga yoga pose okay you don't have time to do a full yoga routine well why don't you just pick one pose get up from your desk and you know do ragdoll or downward dog or just pick something peaceful warrior yeah yeah yes warrior 
um, just to break that cycle of that stress response. Yeah. Mm. I That's really love it, that. Yeah. yeah. Simple things we can do. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I think we just forget about how simple things can get because we overcomplicate the, the self-care aspect of it, right? Like it has to be a full night of whatever. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. It could be five you minutes. An hour on the level. No, you don't. You can do five minutes or 10 minutes, get your heart rate up, go do some stretching, be done. You know, yeah. you did yeah. something. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think it's a, it's a matter of mindset, I guess. It's a mindset shift because I think for a really long time, even for me, it's like, oh, if I'm going to do self-care, it has to be like a full night. No, it doesn't. Now I now I know that, you know, like it can it can be so simple as, you know, just for me, it's like so simple as uh, taking 15 minutes during my lunch break to to read a chapter of a book. That's my self-care, grounding yeah, myself, de-stressing. No. Yeah. So I think it's. It, yeah, it doesn't mean like the stress. The thing is, you know, what I tell all my clients, all my people are. The struggle is real. The stress overload struggle is real. And it's not going away. Like life seems to be getting more complicated. I thought it was supposed to get easier. So what are we going to do to build up that stress armor? Like what you're what you're saying, Lou, is 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 perfect, is awesome that you're taking those moments during the day. And that's that's what adds up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I'm learning. Not perfect. I'm learning. And I'm sure our audience is as well, you know, like uh, through each podcast episode they listen to or you know um, each book that they get through they will learn and pick up a few new things but when it comes to stress management I think it's also a matter of personalizing it you know because we have very different triggers like you said life just gets more complicated it's not going to get any easier and that's how life goes actually like this is like a I mean, part of my growing pains, but I've realized that the the more I grow, the the more you know, the more complicated life gets in a good way because I'm stronger and I can handle more. But it also means I need to understand the different stress triggers that's going to happen for me and how I'm going to deal with them. So, how can people identify their own stress triggers because it's different for different people? You know, um, I, I do a workshop on that. I call it taming your tigers. Um, going back to the stress response, you know, the saber tooth tiger, you know, is yeah. crazy, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> trying to be clever. Um, it's, is really is writing down like all the things that stress you out. Like, is it, you know, do you habitually run late? Oh, I love your Harry Potter water bottle. I love. Yes. This is the, from the play. Um, oh. I went to, I went to the play twice and the second oh, wow. time. The second time I finally got merch. So yeah, this is from Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Very cool. Sorry that we digress. No, um, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to be organic on the show. Absolutely. Um, so it's, and because they are so different, all of us is, is writing them down. And, you know, what I really like people to know is that we all have a story and our story is unique to us and our story is important because it's our story. And so, you know, my story might be a little more complicated or somebody else's might be more complicated, but that doesn't matter because the feelings it's creating, like we share those as a community, all of us, the stories are different, but the feelings and emotions and stress overload is very much the same. Um, so writing them down and then what I suggest, uh, just everything and anything, you know, my husband snores or my wife, you know, wife's partner snores. Um, you know, getting up late, I'm always running late, I'm, you know, all the different things. And then taking a look at them and seeing, well, which ones can I control and which ones can I not control? So the ones I can control, maybe I need to get up 10 minutes earlier. Okay, I know that really sucks, but just make the effort and it'll, or maybe pack my lunch at night. This saves me some time in the morning or different things right and then the things that you cannot control what's the one thing you can control in an uncontrollable situation you right you can control how you react can i can control that my teenager's wigging out and yelling at me no but i can control how i react to her which isn't always the most positive but you know i'm getting better it's a work in progress so understanding um you know 
those different situations. And so how can you tell that you're stressed? Well, maybe you don't know. What do I write down? Well, you start noticing when you get really irritable or you get short tempered, you start not feeling good. You start swirling into sort of negativity. I'm not good enough. Maybe that's something that is a trigger that stressing that is, is causing that. So looking at how something like flips your day, like you're having a great day and one thing happens and all of a sudden you're like, rah, rah, rah. you know, so, so identify those things as well. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Like they gave a lot yeah. of information there. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think totally that's definitely helpful because like you said, it's different for each of us. We all have, we all have our own stories and my stress triggers will not be yours doesn't you know like you have other things to deal with in your life so i think that's really good to first of all identify them and um, equip ourselves with the tool and the next thing i also want to talk about is this work you know it's such a big portion of our lives right whether you're um an employee at an organization you are the leader of the organization you're an entrepreneur working by yourself like no matter the nature of work work is such a big part in our lives and most of the population, you know, go to their workplace every day, whether it be virtual or physical. But we don't talk about self-care enough, I think. And at least this is what I've noticed with my team um, because, you know, sometimes I would notice uh, my team members going online after work hours just because they're stressed out about something and they need to like, you know, like handle it or like manage it because they don't want to leave that until the next day, which shows a sense of responsibility, but it is not a sense of self-care or they be checking messages on their day off. And to me, like I never do that. So I actually, you know, like actually scold them when they do that. Uh, but I, I do think it's really important because from my perspective, it is a culture thing, you know, at the, at the workplace, the culture is really important. So how can we foster this culture of self-care in the workplace? Because the second we don't do that, people are going to feel the pressure to, you know, overperform in the way that is going to impact them. And if they don't have the self-care, they are going to get stressed out. They are going to get burnt out and that's going to impact the quality of work anyway. So it's kind of like this, it's a, it's a cycle, right? It's, a, it's just another cycle that we need to break. Um, because it's not just about, okay, we need to all perform better, but it's also about, you know, these individuals need to take care of themselves so they can show up at work, the best version of themselves. And they are actually going to impact a lot of people that they're going to work with. Right. So, you know, it is starting to, um, you know, the education piece, you know, having people come in to speak you know, um, similar to, you know, like as you lunch and learns and things like that, like have someone come in. So you kind of get all on the same page and then making space for those different things. So, you know, uh, at lunchtime, you know, rather than eating at your desk and focusing on whatever, go outside for 15 minutes. You know, like you, Lou said, you, you read a book, you read a chapter in your book. So making, it has to be very intentional. It's not going to happen just poof. Oh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go for a walk. You have to be very intentional with it. Um, so so somehow putting those things in schedule. So if you have a regular stat team meeting, maybe start your team meeting with some deep breathing and, and toe wiggling. Maybe if it's a long meeting halfway through the meeting, get everybody to stand up and stretch and let's do shoulder rolls and jumping jacks or turn on some music and have a little dance party and shake your money maker, you know, just those little moments, um, again, just to bring that, that stress down. Yeah. Uh, and then boundaries. Like you've talked about boundaries, having those boundaries, making sure that, okay, the last time I checked my emails, you know, is like 7 PM or 9, PM, whatever that 9 PM, whatever that boundary looks like for you and put the phone away and make sure that in the morning, when you get up, you're not, the first thing you're doing is reaching for phone and checking your emails. Find something else. Go enjoy your cup of coffee. Go look out the window. Excuse me. Go for a little walk. You know, start putting those little, little things in your day. And um, you have to, like we have to. Because I don't, I don't like the alternative if we don't. I think a lot of people are, you know, going to get into trouble with the stress overload and burnout. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's the job of leaders to make sure this happens too, because, you know, you lead by example 
and you, you create that environment for your team. And this is something I'm very conscious of because if I'm saying to my team, guys, I'm just going to work tonight. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to have dinner uh, outside of my desk or outside of my home office. My team's going to feel the pressure to do the same. And that's not cool because I'm not leading by example. So, you know, I think it's it's important regardless of where you work or, you know, the, what the nature of the job is. It's so important to to cultivate this and especially the leaders need to know this, right? Because they need to lead by example. And, it's, and it needs to start at the top too. So that, you know, the CEOs and the, you know, the business owners really need, um, you know, to be, be aware of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and if they're not and the, and the employees are, then maybe, you know, the employees can get together and talk to the leader and say, Hey, you know, we would really like to do something or, yeah. you know, as a team building, go out bowling or go to the park or have a picnic in the park. So your, yeah. your team building does, isn't always like, we're going to go sit in the bar tonight. We're actually going to go do something. We're going to go to, you know, top golf we have here where you can just hit balls off the, see how far you can hit them. And yeah. um, so different activities that you would plan as a team mm. that revolve around self-care. Yeah, hundred percent. But it, but it's an intentional. It's an intentional movement. Um, it's like not just going to happen by itself. Mm-hmm. Definitely, so. definitely couldn't agree more. So the last question in this part, the very big question, actually, we've talked a little bit about you know stress management in the workplace and um, fostering this culture of self care in the workplace. But what about our society as a whole? You know, what is the future of stress management and self care? Well, if we don't start making some changes, then we're really going to be in trouble. So, I, you know, I, I hope it's, you know, we have to be making some changes. And, and I and I think it starts with ourselves being more intentional. Um, you know, with the mental health, there's just so many, you know, things we're seeing. Like even in the news here in the United States, there's, you know, one mass shooting after another. And I... I firmly believe that is because people are stress overloaded and do not know where to put their anger and their rage, which is caused by can also be caused by stress overload. And, you know, they're they're They think that, you know, firing a gun into a group of people is a is a great way to handle it. So uh, I think it, you know, it really needs we need to be talking about it more. We need to be doing it more. We need to show people what we're doing, what's working for us. Maybe it'll work for them. It, it this really needs to be a proactive movement. Um, yeah, we just we really need to get educated and understand what's going on with this stress. So, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, totally. It is a very big thing. You know, we we're talking about society, uh, but when we really break it down, is you know each of us doing our part, and that's the most important thing. So I think it's it's great that we get all these messages from you and all the tools and tricks and tips as to how we can take care of ourselves, manage our stress better through self-care. Uh, but now let's get even more practical. Let's talk about something that you do. You know, I know you've mentioned the 30 seconds of breathing and, you know, when you're driving, that's really funny. Like, I really like that when you're kind of like explaining the, what is it called? 77 or something? Yeah, I-77. Inter- oh, yeah. Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love when you talked about that because I, I think a lot of people can relate to that. You know, some people have long drives and they go to work and it's just dreadful. So... All those tips aside, what is another practice that you personally use to manage your stress and optimize your own functioning through self-care? Uh, well, I play with my dog. We have two cats and a dog. So um, we play our version. Kiko is our puppy who's like 11 months old. We play our version of catch with the ball, which basically means she has the ball and I'm going to, you know, run around and tease you with it and try to take it from me. So finding those moments, I've been a lot more intentional about going outside. So even I'll take my cup of coffee. I just drink a cup or two in the morning and I will go outside and sit on the steps in the sunshine, which might not work in your winter time right now. Um, and journaling. I, I, I've journaled since I was 16 years old and I'm not as good with it anymore, but I think you know, journaling's really powerful too, because you just get all your thoughts on paper. 
And, you know, to those people that that feel like, you know, they need to write one more email or solve that one more problem, why don't you write it down on a piece of paper in note form? Just take a notepad, write down what you want to say so you won't forget it, and then just deal with it tomorrow. Um, spending time with my family, um, engaging in communication, like good communication and having fun. Like my husband and I go on date night every Wednesday night, even though our girls, you know, they can stay home alone. We don't need a babysitter or anything, but still we make a point to go out and engaging with friends. So, you know, all those simple things that we know, they all count and they all add up. Yeah. And these seems to be daily practices that you can easily incorporate into your lives and you know um, some of them not not so much daily but weekly but I feel like you know there's there's so many things we can do depending on what we like right um, I, I like to talk to my friends um, especially with the, the singles in my life we just talk about how we take ourselves on our own date night you know like We take ourselves out to somewhere nice yeah, or just absolutely. do something That's we awesome. enjoy. That is self-care and, you know, like really switching off from work, um, not being in front of a screen. Like I like to take myself on reading dates. Like I just go to a cafe, bring a book, read. Um, it's a change of environment. Um, you know, it's just a cup of tea. It's not uh, not much money, but it actually changes a lot. Like I feel much happier and connected to myself and journaling. Totally agree with you. Such great practice. Um, and s same as you, I'm not as good as I used to be when I was younger, but like, I still really enjoy journaling. And, um, one of the things I picked up recently, and I just want to share this because it's really fun. Hopefully it helps our audience is I watched this video from this YouTuber called Lana Blakely. Um, she's like really big on lifestyle and, you know, like self-development and living lighter. Um, and she talked about journaling in the way that it's kind of like similar to stop and smell the roses where she should actually like describes what happened that day or, you know, um, in that moment in her journal, like as if it's kind of like romanticizing life, you know, like, oh, like the sky was this color or like, what is the smell in the air? Or, like the temperature, the feeling you describe all of that in your journal. And I realized that that is not something we do enough, at least for me, because when I'm journaling, most of the time, I'm like, oh, something really incredible happened or something really bad happened. And I'm just dumping everything on paper. I'm not really thinking about like describing the life that's happening around me. And I feel like that helps so much. It's kind of, it elevates the journaling game and it actually helps you to enjoy and cherish your life so much more. So that's, I thought is a little something I can add to the conversation would be hopefully helpful to the audience because I really enjoy that. Yeah, I, I like that take on that because how often do we really notice that when we go step outside, um, you know, here is starting to get more humid. So I start to notice that. But like, do we just like really pause and, you know, oh, I can feel, you know, the wind's blowing a little bit or look at, you know, there's a few clouds. Yeah, like that's very, yeah, being very, very intentional. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, so we've covered our theories, our practice. And finally, before we let you go, let's talk about open mic. Let's talk about something that you are passionate passionate about. It doesn't have to be about the topic of the day. I have a feeling you might mention it, but take it away. This is your state. Yeah, you know, I think it's really mental health. I I think, you know, Lou, you shared that, uh, you know, you were burnt out. And um, I'm going to share with you that right now I'm going through a phase of burnout. I just realized the other day that, you know, I'm involved in a lot of things, Um You know, I'm a contract speaker with a large company here and I love to do my own workshops and I love to share. And I just haven't been feeling like I haven't had the energy. And, you know, I do, I have dealt with depression and anxiety in the past. I, I mean, I still deal with it. It's not, it doesn't go away. I have to manage it. And I think it's just so important to, to understand, you know, your audience understands it's okay not to be okay. You know, all the things we see on Facebook and Instagram, those are the perfect, wonderful moments of life. They, it isn't real. Um, so as far as the way I'm going to be dealing with my burnout is in July and August, I'm pretty much going to be stepping back from some responsibilities at church and in my networking group. I'm on the leadership team and and I have a number of responsibilities and I'm just going to cut back and focus on going to the gym regularly and get back into that habit and focus on my family and focus on, you know, first and foremost myself because if you if you don't fill your cup there's no way that you can fill anybody else's and you can't give your best self to other people 
you know, your kids, your husband, your wives, your partners, your, you know, if you don't take care of yourself. So I think, I think that's really important. And it's okay to ask for help. You know, I have a counselor. I go once a month. My girls go to counseling. My husband's been to counseling. Uh, I get my massage um, if I could every week, but usually, you know, once every three to four weeks, you know, take care of yourself and, um, you know, reach out, reach out to different, you know, if you need a counselor. I know um, I'm an, an ambassador with Mental Health America here and I'm a storyteller and I there's several stories that I will, sh- you know, I share at uh, different um, events and things like that. And they offer now, they now offer free counseling. So I don't know if your counselors in Australia are, are very busy and very booked like they are here, but still reach out. And um, you not you don't have to suffer in silence with depression and, and struggles. So I guess that's my open mic is ask for help. It takes a community. Yeah, I used definitely. to be. I used to be a lone wolf. I used to think I could handle everything. I had a very, you know, my mom was very strong, sort of a typical German, very determined and stubborn and strong. And and sh- boy, you know, she was organized. And um, I used to think I had to be able to do it all myself. And no, you don't. You don't. Yeah, you don't have to. You can rely on people. You should reach out for help when you feel like you need the help. I, I think that's something that I'm slowly learning to do as well. Because, you know, being, being here alone in a foreign country with no family, uh, I think it was like, it was kind of like something I had to embrace, you know, asking for help. I do not like asking for help whatsoever, like at all. No. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a really nice message that you shared with us. And we should all be reminded that it's okay to ask for help. It doesn't show that you're weak, actually. It shows that you're really strong and you, you have the support from people that care about you. Absolutely. And then, you know, being able to admit to yourself, you know, I teach all this stuff, right? And then for me to say, yeah, I'm, I'm suffering from burnout. So I need to step back a little bit for a couple of months. So then in the fall, you know, our fall, um, I'll, I'll be able to show up even stronger and better and, and, you know, even serve my purpose, you know, with, with more in, intentionality and positivity. So, yeah, you know, and it's, it's okay. Like the seasons, you know, we need to let our bodies sort of go with the seasons as well. And we don't yeah. have to be high energy all the time. So absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's struggle is real. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. thank you so much for being so vulnerable with us. And, you know, this is exactly what Brene Brown talks about all the time. And I know that you, you like her books. Um, so I, I would say it's, it's something that you're embracing and really appreciate that. Before I let you go, if our audience would like to reach out to you or find out more about your work, where should they go? Well, my website is simpleselfcare.net. And if you want to email me, it's Rita, R-I-T-A, at simpleselfcare.net. I would love to hear from you. Any questions, any comments? Um, Again, my purpose to serve however I can help you. Uh, That would be it. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. It's been such a fun conversation. And honestly, we could go on all day. Probably. But I had to, I, I had to like hold myself back. I'm like, Delu, do not go there. Uh, focus. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's really fun talking to you. I learned so much. And um, yeah, you've been really open and honest and vulnerable. And that's what we appreciate. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. You've been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast produced by the Happiness Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at ha.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Lu Ngo. Thanks for tuning in.